ओम परम ब्रह्मा परम ज्योति परमात्मा ने श्री 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 सत्य साई भगवान नमोस्तुते आई ऑफर माय मोस्ट हम्बल एंड लविंग प्रणाम्स एट भगवान लोटस फीट थैंक यू तुलसी जी फॉर अलाउिंग मी टू बी हियर एंड शेयरिंग वॉट एवर लिटल ट्रेजर ऑफ मेमोरीज दैट वी हैव लिविंग विद भगवान which was a very very beautiful time that's all i can say every day was a festival you know literally we used to look forward to going for darshan to seeing him you know every every day was a new experience it was amazing uh, especially in the 80s when i came and uh, let me just uh, you know uh, remind myself that when we came when i came to swami first I thought the people before the students who came before us enjoyed a lot, and then uh, later on, you know, as time passed, I found that students who came after me felt that we enjoyed a lot. So uh, the main thing is that being with Swami itself, you know, at uh, different points of time, it didn't matter which time, was uh, really divine. Uh, so just you know to. Uh, you know one of the surprising things that i found right you know swami used to say nobody can come to my lotus feet unless i call them unless i will it unless he, they have my grace and uh, i act, he, i actually uh, learned about it in a very practical way one of my first visits to putaparti i was in you know we used to travel to dharmavaram first and then come so i was in the train traveling to dharmavaram uh and uh, there was one young person sitting next to me so we got talking he started asking me where are you from where are you going etc so when i when he asked me where are you going i said i'm going to putaparti you know when we are new devotees we very excited so i was very excited i was going to put a party for the first time etc et et so i told him i'm going to put a party and his reply was where is that so i was kind of surprised and i asked him where are you from he said i am from ananthpur and this surprised me even more because ananthpur is very close to put a party i was coming from kashmir in the middle of kashmir udampur one place called udampur all the way and here i found that this person's you know living born and living next to putaparthi did not know where putaparthi was and it dawned on me that what swami actually spoke so many times which i had read in satyasai speaks that nobody can you know come to me until i will it was really true you know and uh, and i realized that there are lots of people who are staying very close to putaparthi maybe even in putaparthi in fact i later on i came to know so many uh, experiences of so many people and uh, they actually did not have swami darshan even when some of them were in putaparthi so you know so i realized that, that is very true so we should be first and foremost uh, you know we should all anybody who this is what i tell everyone anybody who has had a glimpse of bhagwan who has known the name of bhagwan who is able to say sai ram is a very fortunate human being uh, you know because this is a grace this is not that uh, it has come out of nowhere it is a grace that has been bestowed and i have met people who know swami but have never seen swami but swami has fulfilled all their desires i'll give you a small example just before coming to putaparthi my parents were in patna and they were very active in you know in the seva samiti there was one gentleman who was working with the government he was like a clerk working in the uh, state government he had an ailing mother so uh, when i went swami had sent me home during that time uh, to my parents he had insisted in fact that i should go home and there's a reason we'll talk about that later why he does things so when i went there i met this gentleman and he was the only one who used to always be there for the seva we used to go into the interior villages to orphanages you know blind schools he used to always be there if no one is there he will be there you know and my i remember my mother she used to drive the car i used to sit with her some my father was not always available 
and this gentleman would always be there. so we used to you know get talking and i was very curious i asked him have you ever been to putwarti he said no i have never been to putwarti have you seen swami physically i have never seen swami physically i said you have you have so devoted he said there's a reason for that so when i asked him the reason he said my mother is ailing for a very long time i don't earn the kind of salary where i can provide medicine for her then what do you do whenever i need medicine i stand in front of swami's picture i pray baba i need medicine for my mother and it, he said it's been now 10 years the medicine has never failed to arrive somehow or the other without my paying the medicine always arrives now this is like one of i, I felt Un, an unbelievable miracle how can you can understand that happens once it can happen twice but for 10 years continuously and the most important thing is you know how swami comes into your life he, I, either you hear about him or you experience something i first heard about him and i heard about him from a classmate of mine who is now in working in the un uh, he his parents were uh, great devotees of baba so there was also another muslim classmate and we were having board exams i remember it was the 10th board we were all busy studying you know we used to study late at night uh, we were given uh, infrastructure and uh, separate places where we could study late in the night so we don't disturb the other students who who, who had to sleep and get up early in the morning um so one night these were these people were arguing very loudly and it was disturbing me because i was next to that person's uh, cubicle so they were arguing see he was a muslim so he said god cannot be a human being and this person naturally being some his devotee was saying no sai baba is god etc etc and trying to prove that and this argument went on for about 30 to 45 minutes so the words sai baba first came and fell on my ear from there i finally i you know i wanted to study and i was not able to uh, concentrate because it, you know how it happens when there's an argument goes louder and louder and louder then i i went to them and i said look please I, i'm trying to study here so now you are a muslim you believe he's not god so he's not god for you and you know you have seen him and you believe he's god so he's god for you now for god's sake that you said <laughs> i i still remember that interaction so uh, that was the first time i actually heard about baba uh, the next thing was my mother had an opportunity in chandigarh when swami came to punjab and somebody told her you know why don't we go and see him she's uh, she was very uh, private person in the sense she didn't like huge crowds and all and she said no no there'll be a huge crowd there and i'm not going so she missed that opportunity you know but swami had started you know slowly and right now this is what i was trying to say he waits you know shirdi baba used to say shraddha and saburi he practice that swami doesn't rush into your life he waits he waits for the right moment he waits until you are ripe you know and he does that because not because he has some kind of ego or something it's because that will benefit you more in your spiritual evolution and everything that has to do with swami every small action is about that it's about your spiritual evolution ultimately that is the goal and when i was in parthi i noticed one thing it didn't matter what age you were you may be 7 years old you may be 70 years old when you come to swami the process is always the same unlearn whatever you have learned and relearn what he wants you to learn you know and sometimes it becomes a painful process by the way because we come with a set ideas we come with ideas that are preset you know god is like this god is like that you know maybe he is he is always good he is always but sometimes it can be very harsh some lessons are very harsh and we have all faced it i'm sure uh and he does that because not because you know he likes to admonish you he will only admonish you when it leads to spiritual evolution this is what i have noticed 
So, uh, you know, we when I came to Puttaparthi the first time, uh, I'll tell you, Swami used to come, and he, I used to practice yoga before I uh, learned about Swami. And Swami, the moment I started uh, reading about Swami, the moment I started now worshipping Him, meditating on Him, my yoga practice evolved in leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. Even my guru who taught me the yoga, he was also a great person. And he came from a lineage of Himalayan masters. So when I came into contact with Baba, this practice of doing yoga kind of took a different turn and started evolving spiritually. And uh, it's Kundalini yoga. So suddenly experience of Kundalini became a reality. It was a theory first. Okay? You know, we are practicing this yoga and it is to raise the Kundalini. And then I suddenly started experiencing the Kundalini. So even my teacher was like the, the person who taught me the yoga, the guru. He was surprised when I told him. He said, no, this happens after like years of practice and you have just started. And then I, he said, describe it to me. So I described it to him and he said, but how can, how can it be? So when I tried to tell him about Baba, he used to say, it is possible, it is possible, you <laughs> know, like that. So, but I knew it was because of Swami. I knew it was because of Swami. And I had great experiences. So uh, coming, coming to the point um, which I was trying to make is, spiritual evolution has always been the goal of Swami's thing. So when he comes into our life, he changes it totally. So my life changed like 180 degrees. I was in a materialistic society. I was in a westernized world. I remember my my mother was the one who actually, you know, uh, uh, brought us to Swami's feet. She was very devoted. And, uh, but we never questioned Baba. We accepted a lot of things about him, even before meeting him. For example, my mother had a small picture of Swami in, in a bedside table. When, and she was the one who used to go for bhajan. We were five families, uh, devotees in Udhampur. And uh, there used to be bhajans every Thursday. So she would go for the bhajans. None of us would go, neither my father nor me nor my brother. We were too busy. <laughs> but uh, the photo next to her bedside, you know, would always be uh, sprinkled with uh, amrit. We call it amrit, devotees call it amrit. It would always be sprinkled. And every time when that happened, she would call all of us to see. We never questioned, you know, why it happened, how it happened. We just accepted it that this is a fact and moved on. We didn't think too much about it. And uh, the reason is because my family has come into contact, uh, even in my Teva, we call it Teva, the astrological chart. It is written, I will come into contact with great uh, spiritual beings from time to time. So that used to happen. So we, we had seen a lot of things spiritual things, you know, uh, transcendental things, we call it supernatural things. And we took this also for granted, this is also like one of them. So, uh, now being from a Western background, I was very fond of music. One of my passions was music. I had a band, uh, a rock band actually. And uh, for many years we played. In fact, people actually thought that I would uh, become a you know singer and a rock uh, band player and it we had a lovely band we used to be called even uh, outside to play and we were very uh, famous in the place where we were so i was very fond of, and this was rock music this was western music you know uh, and i still remember that now coming from that background you know had i heard bhajans ever no did i sing bhajans ever no my uh, experience of God was when my mother used to drag me every Tuesday to the Hanuman temple because she was a great devotee of Hanuman. So Tuesday, every Tuesday, she, I had to accompany her to the Hanuman. That was the closest I ever got to thinking about God. And it was like a routine. Okay, today's Tuesday. I have to go with my mother. I have no choice. So get ready, get bathed, go, um, bow down, you know. And uh, I never prayed to Hanuman for anything. I just did Namaskar because everybody was doing Namaskar. So we also did Namaskar. 
and uh, my mother would do the prayers i would wait and then come back i never prayed for anything ever you know so this was the situation i was in then swami's birthday came so after my mother started going for bhajans swami's first birthday came that's the time everything changed she uh, she wanted that uh, they they we had held an akhand bhajan like uh, 24 hour bhajan for swami's birthday these five families all of them were devoted even the children except me and my brother so uh, my mother wanted us to attend the last one hour uh, she, my she told my father you have to come he had no choice <laughs> my brother had no choice also because he was young he was told that you have to get ready and you have to come now the problem was me so i remember she came into my room i still remember when she came into my room loud rock music was playing and uh, she closed the door and she said ask me to turn down the music so i stopped it she said if i ask you something will you say yes promise me I said, "How can I promise you if you if you don't tell me what it is? Because I knew there's a catch somewhere. When my mother says that some catch will be there, which I I knew I wouldn't like to do it. So I I I also you know hedged a little and I said, no, I unless you tell me, I won't promise. You know. And this continued for about a few minutes, and then finally she played her trump card. She said, you can't do even this much for me. You know. So that kind of melted me down, and I said, okay, what do I have to do? And she said, you have to come for the bhajan. Last one hour, you have to attend the bhajan, Swami's bhajan. I said, you know, I, I literally told her like this. I said, uh, Ma, look at me. I'm, I'm listening to rock music. I'm saying, you want me to go and attend boring bhajans? <laughs> you know, this, these are my words, literally words, my words. And she said, yes, please do it for me. Then I, I put a condition. I said, okay, I have one condition. You give me the car keys. If I get bored. I'll drive home, and you have to make your own way home. I knew that a lot of people were there, so you know they can easily get a lift. She agreed, so it was decided Thursday coming Thursday. It was Thursday. It happened to be Thursday. So I mean, um, you know, birthday. Bhajans were ending on that day, and we went. So I was driving the car. We went, and uh, I was not very keen, but since I promised, you know. That, Because, why was I not keen? Because I was a very avid rider. I used to love riding, and uh, one of my routines was every evening I would go for a ride, and that was like one of my, you know, uh, what should I say, uh, things that I looked forward to a lot. Uh, I loved horses, I loved dogs, these kind of things. So I used to always look forward to that, but. I had to sacrifice that, so I was, you know, very happy about it. And we went for the bhajan, and uh, we ent- all of us entered the hall, and I sat down cross-legged like everybody else. There were a lot of photos. Swami's photo was there. A lot of uh, saints, sages, all these photographs were there. People were singing bhajans, you know. Uh, now I know they were singing very well. They were doing. Good. So when I sat down, I looked around for some time, and then suddenly. I got lost, and a feeling descended on me. You know, and the only way I can describe it is as what is given in the Bible as the peace that passeth understanding. That's the phrase. I got immersed in that. That I had never experienced such peace in my life, and I got lost. I was immersed in that. I forgot where I was. One hour passed. Suddenly, I realized people were getting up for arti. I got up and I stood there, and I was in a t- totally different world altogether. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to, you know, say anything. I just want to be wanted to be in that state, in that feeling. You know, Arti got over, and my mother was surprised. Okay, yeah, the guy is still here. <laughs> How come? She didn't say anything, and uh, I quietly handed the key, driving key, the car keys to my father. Didn't say anything. And he also took it quietly, and we drove home. And on the way, I remember my mother saying, "You are very quiet today." I didn't answer that also, you know, because I didn't want to lose that feeling. I was in such a feeling, and I really, really experienced so much of peace. And 
The only time I experienced that peace after that was when I came to Puttaparthi and I sat in the veranda. Every time I sit in the veranda in the Puttaparthi, I have that experience. I experience this beautiful. Now it is a beautiful feeling of peace, you know. So we went home, and uh, the next Thursday, we, because my mother used to go for uh, you know budgets on Thursday. So next Thursday, I got ready, dressed, ready, and waiting for her. So when she stepped out onto the veranda, I was already there, and I was dressed and ready and bathed. Then she asked me. She said, "You didn't you go for your riding?" And I said, uh, "No, I didn't." Then what are you waiting for? I said, "I'm waiting to accompany you." Are you sure? I said, "Yes, I'm very sure." She didn't say anything. She just uh, uh, went to the car. I sat down. We went to bhajan, and that's where. The process started, so now that became my routine. Every Thursday, go for bhajan, attend the bhajan, and slowly got involved in the seva activities. Now, as uh, time passed, uh, my meditation and things became more intense, and Swami started coming in my dreams. And then uh, the dreams were the same. He would uh, talk to me about Vedas, you know, continuously for months. Every time the dream would be. I would be walking with Swami in some place which I didn't recognize, and he would be giving me uh, uh, some lessons, some uh, you know uh, discourses about the Vedas, and then I would get up with those. So I was very uh, intent that when I came to Puttaparthi, I should learn Vedas. But in one of the dreams, just before I got selected, uh, even before I gave the exam. Swami came in my dream, and he showed me the college. You know, he took me around the veranda or near the Ganesh temple towards the auditorium. He opened the door and he showed me the auditorium. And he said, "This is my college auditorium." I remember that because when I came here as a student, when I looked at the college, I said, "I've seen this place. I've seen this. I know this place." You know, this, and I asked somebody, "Is that the auditorium?" He said, "Yeah, that is the auditorium." So I had all somebody had already showed me the college, and then as it came near for me to, and I still didn't know it that I was going to give an exam and then be selected in Swami's college. As it came near, Swami again and uh, appeared in my dream, and now I was sitting in the mandir veranda, you know, behind in the outer veranda, and Swami came. Walking down, and he asked me, "What is your name?" And I told him my name, and he said, "I have selected you as my student. You will join my college." Okay, so that was okay, but how we don't know because I was still studying. In, you know, I was already studying in a college. I was doing my B.Sc. Uh, physics was my major, and uh, so we didn't know how that was going to happen. But things then suddenly took a turn, and. And the turn was i saw swami physically in delhi so then the desire you know to join uh, his college had not still not developed would and would not have developed because, until my mother told me because my uh, desire was i want to give up everything and i wanted to go to the himalayas so uh, and i was having a lot of spiritual experiences Even in school, I had a couple of spiritual experiences. Again, I think it was Swami who gave me that. I know that Swami gave me that that later on. So I wanted to go to Himalaya. So my mother said, "Why don't you go to Puttaparthi and ask Baba, you know, whether you should go to Himalaya or not?" And then that thing, that stone started rolling, and then Mrs. Malotha, General Malotha's wife, was there. She said, "Why don't you join Swami's college?" So okay, the idea sounded good to me, and. Uh, Uh, you know this was going on, and then my mother wrote to uh, Kasturi ji to ask him how I could join the college. So this was going on, and then Swami's reply came in his own handwriting: "Please send your son uh, to join the college. Exam is on such day." We didn't know it was Swami's handwriting that time. We we thought it was from Kasturi ji because he had written, my mother had written to Kasturi ji, and so on. So I came to give the exam on the one day before the exam. I came to Puttaparthi, and that was also a miracle because my father 
did not want me to come here because I was already doing college. And when it came to Swami's college, I wanted to join from the first year. And my father said, you're wasting your time. And I said, no, this is not a time waste. This is Swami's college. I want to be there for as long as I, as I can. And five years is the maximum. And, I, and look at the foolishness of this little mind. I thought I can get self-realization in five years. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanted to spend five years and attain self-realization. And, you know, some of sometimes in the beginning, when we don't understand the power that Swami is, the Shakti, we, we treat Him as a human being. And I had the temerity to talk to Bhagwan about this topic. You know, and Swami was so patient with me. So, my teachers complained. Because when I came to Puttaparthi, my mind was completely engrossed in Baba. I had nothing else in my mind. Only Swami, Swami, Swami. I could not think of anything else. And it was such a beautiful experience. I never ran in the mandir when you know students run and sit in front. I never did that. I never tried. Why? Because I was in that particular state of mind which I didn't want to disturb. So I used to walk slowly. And usually I used to be the last person. So I would be sitting somewhere at the end in the veranda. And uh, towards the outer side. And Swami would come for darshan and we, I would just smile at him and he would smile so beautifully at me, you know. It was such a divine and yet a beautiful smile. And this was like every day. And then he would finish his interviews and without fail, it would be like half an hour, 40 minutes, he would come and talk, you know. Which I didn't realize that, like what a blessing it was in those days. So, but I, what happened is, in, in that process, my studies suffered. So, I was getting low grades and I had joined the science uh, uh, group uh, because I gave the exam. And uh, the way I gave the exam also, like I said, I came, I, gave, I came one day before the exam. I sat in the registrar's office and filled the form. And I think he got a little irritated also because we had to say why we want to join. And I asked him, what do you want me to write here? He said, you write what you, <laughs> whatever you want. And, you know, I filled that form, gave it to him. Next day, I gave the exam, and I, I really wasn't prepared for the exam, frankly speaking. So, you know, this is one of the things that used to happen to me before I became a student. Swami used to speak to me inside. He would actually speak sentences, and, you know, I could hear him. The inner voice, as I call it. He would say, tick this answer, and I would tick Take that answer, take the answer. I, I wouldn't know whether that answer is right or not. So I did my exam like that. But uh, fortunately for me, I don't know whether I gave the right answers or not because I don't have the results. But later on, uh, I was told by the warden at that time that Swami selected you. So we used to have these photographs on the uh, sheet of paper and Swami would tick, you know, this person, this person, this person. So, I happen to be one of the fortunate ones with, whose name, uh, photo Swami had taken. So I got selected. My name was last on the list and so on. So I got selected for that. I had a very interesting interview with Professor Gokak and uh, others you know, at that time. So that's how I came to uh, join Swami's college. So now this was a world which was totally different for me. You know? For Number one, I had my own room. A lot of privacy. When I joined Swami's college, I was I had to sleep on the floor. Not used to it at all, ever in my life. Except when I went camping or something like that. And uh, I had to sleep with a lot of different people in like a dormitory, which was again something I'm not I wasn't used to. And you know, Swami does this. Uh, I was very fortunate to get A1. So the first night I was in the hostel. Those days, Prasadam used to go. Swami used to partake from all the hostels. And then he would send the food back at Prasadam. So, being in Avon, the first night itself, I got Swami Prasadam. I know, remember somebody waking me up at, because I used to sleep early, I used to get up early. I used to get up at around 2.30 in the morning. So, this was a different world for me, totally, because I had no privacy. One person used to keep the light on, because he was studying. The rest of us were sleeping. Then when he slept, another person would get up early and start studying. So the light was never off. I was not used to sleeping with the light on. 
But slowly, Swami, you know, uh, what should I say, trained me in that way, you know, where you put on a hundred lights now, I can sleep no problem, you know, like that. So he, that's what I mean by physically, mentally, he actually makes you unlearn things and prepares you, real, makes you learn what he wants you to learn. And then I remember I was very attached to my yoga, my, you know, my routine, but he made everybody ill in my room. I was the only one who was not ill. So I could not do my yoga. I could not do my uh, sadhana or whatever meditation. I spent almost like a month just serving the students in my room. I used to bring them their food. I used to bring them the medicine. I used to make sure everybody takes the medicine. I used to clean their clothes, you know, things like that. So for one month, I just served these uh, people. And he made me realize that, uh, you know, sadhana is not just doing yoga, doing meditation. Service is also very important. And he made me learn that through that uh, particular experience. Like one of the things he's, he told us when we were new, he called us one morning. In Puttaparthi, we now go for morning darshan. He called us in the morning, a group of us. There were about 10, 15 of us. And he gave us these Sevadal scarves. Those days they were like orange and yellow scarves. And he, he actually put them on around all, all of us. He gave us a 40 minute discourse about the meaning of Seva, what would our duties be, and so on. Our job was to accompany Swami wherever he went. The moment he left the mandir, our job was to accompany Swami whenever he went out. So I remember there used to be a jeep with Swami's driver. It used to come to the college. The driver used to tell the principal. We used to hop into the, uh, the jeep and we would all be excited. And then we would wait near the Gokulam somewhere and Swami's car would come and then we would accompany him. And those were like some of the best uh, uh, experiences we had because sometimes when Swami would be alone, you know, he would actually interact with us because we were at the back of the jeep. He was in the, and he would make you know signs and make us laugh sometimes or just uh, tease us. You know those kind of things. So it used to be very nice. And then every time we got out, we had to be around him, uh, make sure that uh, nobody you know because people in the excitement would sometimes push and also crowd control used to be part of it. So you know that was that used to be very. Very nice, very nice experiences. So when I came first to Swami, I, he started with that, the physical transformation about my behavior first. And I, and I learned what Swami says, that there are, you know, you are now Swami's student and a thousand eyes are watching you, you know. So you have to be careful in whatever you do. That means you have to think very deeply about every action of yours. So, uh, I remember uh, that it was the first Sunday, we came for Darshan. I was sitting again on the upper portico, but behind, a little bit behind. Uh, and, you know, there used to be a yoga uh, stamp there, and uh, with a circle, and then a Gan Ganpati in front. Lady sitting on one side on the sands, Jain sitting. So, I just happened to sit in, in the front part of the upper portico at the back. And I was reading a book uh, about Swami. I happened to look up and when I looked out outwards, it just happened that my eyes met my mother's eyes. My mother was sitting on the corner of the lady's side. I had no idea how I was supposed to behave at that time. So I gave a big smile and I waved to my mother and she waved back. And then I returned to my book. Swami was in the in interview room. After the interview, he you know, nonchalantly kind of walked down on the VIP side of the veranda until he was parallel to me and as if he's talking to somebody. And then he, and he, then he turned to me and he asked me, boy, what's your name? <laughs> so I stood up and I said, Swami, this is my name. Where are you from? So Swami used to call me Udhampur. So I said, Swami, I came from Udhampur. Ah, did you come alone or you came with somebody? So, <laughs> so I said, Swami, I came with my mother. So where, where is she? You know, very innocently. And I turned around and I pointed to my mother. And he said, hey, what did you do when I was in the interview? I said, Swami, I waved and I smiled at my mother. Then 
you know, actually, I had done something which everybody thought, <laughs> that's it, his, his uh, time here is over. <laughs> like, but Swami was very kind, uh, you know, he, very, very nicely and very compassionately. He said, he told me, he said, see, you are Swami's student now. You have to behave in a different way. First thing is you should not look at the lady's side, number one. And you should certainly not wave to your mother. So, because, you know, a thousand eyes are watching you. So that was my first lesson, that I have to change my behavior. So, and then he said, uh, promise me you will not do it again. I said, Swami, I promise. Ah, okay. Then he called me and gave me Namaskar and I went back to my. So that was one of the, so the first uh, change was the behavior, the physical behavior itself. I couldn't meet my mother in public. And Swami, especially in one of the interviews, he told my mother also, he told me also, I give you permission if you want to meet uh, your son and if you want to meet your mother, you tell the warden, you go to the room and meet. Because when you are outside, people don't know whether you know who you are, mother and son, sister, brother, etc., etc. And they have all these thoughts, different kinds of thoughts, they wonder. So, one of the things he taught me was that, so physically, we are supposed to behave in a particular way. You should not uh, uh, disturb anybody else's thought process, you know, very important. So, that's what I learned, the, one of the first lessons. The other was the mental process. Swami wanted, always wants his students to be able to think subtly. You know, you know, once Swami has described, there are three types of devotees. One who actually literally do whatever he says. And the other ones are the ones which kind of, uh, you know, they can read between the lines and know what has to be done, not literally what has to be done. And the third is the best, he said, the ones who anticipate what he wants and do it, do it before he does, says it all, you know, expects. So, uh, so he was leading me from the first phase to the last phase. And I still remember one experience, uh, one of the earliest experiences I had. Again, it was uh, a, a weekend, a Sunday. I had decided, you know, my routine, what I'm going to do, I'll clean my cupboard, I'll do this, I'll do that. Uh, all very good, good stuff, you know, good, good stuff. And then uh, one of my classmates, whom Swami used to call my brother, Always, my brother, not my, my, my real brother, he never used to say is your brother. He used to call that boy my brother. So, whenever we went, we used to go for interviews also together like that. He came with a Nintendo game. Those days, Nintendo games were very popular. So, he came with a Nintendo game and uh, he said, why don't you come and play with me? And I said, no, I'm busy. I have to do these things and let's not play games. Swami may not like it, etc. But he somehow persuaded me, chalo, one game. So, we started with that one game, but we spent the whole day playing Nintendo, these games. Then came the time for Darshan. Now, uh, during that time, when it came near for the, the, the time for going for Darshan, I, I felt guilty. I decided something, I did something else, and I knew the Swami would not be happy, right? Anyway, we can't escape whatever we have done, we've done, that's over. So we got ready, we bathed, we got ready. And those days we didn't have lines, you know. So the moment we got ready, we went for Darshan. And I, that day I didn't sit in front. I sat a little behind, so I, you know, I, I was guilty. So, but then Swami came, I forgot about everything. So first I was a little uh, nervous, but Swami didn't, you know, uh, show anything. So slowly I became more confident until I became absolutely confident Swami is not going to say anything. That's the time he decides now is the time to. So he wanted me to learn this subtle aspect, how I should understand what he's saying, not uh, he literally telling me. So after the interview, Swami opened the door and in his, you know, soft gliding motion, he comes down. I'm sitting in the middle of the veranda towards the VIP side and there's a gentleman on the VIP veranda. He is sitting there in front of the center door of the mandir. 
Swami comes, he looks at him and talks to him. And he's somebody from the army itself. Uh, he, 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 because Swami told him, Colonel, how are you, etc., etc. So, and then he said, Swami, I'm leaving today. Can I do Namaskar? Can, can I take Namaskar? Swami said, ah, chesku, chesku. And then just when he was bending down to take Namaskar, Swami moved back, withdrew from him, looked at me and said, Juta Bhakti, Juta Bhakti. So, uh, th- th- that guy got a little, uh, you know, taken aback and he looked up and said, don't worry, don't worry, take, 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 and pacified him. Now, that Juta Bhakti, Juta Bhakti was meant for me, right? But my Moti Buddhi, you know, still no, <laughs> not uh, uh, transformed yet, you know. So, I'm th- I was thinking, my thought process was, poor guy, you know, Juta Bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> and so Swami gave him Namaskar and then returned back into the interview room. He gave me a couple of minutes to absorb. But, you know, Moti Buddhi again, you know. Didn't realize it was for me. So I'm very happy and I'm thinking, poor guy. And then suddenly the door snapped open, literally snapped open. Swami, his dhoti pulled up. His marched at great speed and he came straight to me and he said, Aaj Sunday tha, kya kya? So, <laughs> now I'm on the spot. <laughs> what did you do? Uh, today is Sunday. What did you do? How did you spend your time? Now, I cannot tell Swami. It's embarrassing to tell Swami in front of everybody, Swami, I was playing Nintendo game. I should have. But I felt very embarrassed to say that. And so, I just looked at him very pleadingly and I kept quiet. Well, you know, Swami can be very forceful. So he waited for my reply. I didn't answer. Bolo, bolo. Aaj Sunday tha. Kya kya? Now I started praying. Swami, you know what I've done, but I cannot say this in front of everybody. Please take me inside. I will tell you what I've done. <laughs> but no, he, you know, he, he didn't give up. So he waited for the answer. I didn't. Then he looked away and I was kind of really, I thought maybe he has given up. No, he didn't give up. He looked back and he said, Aaj Sunday tha, bolo, kya kya? <laughs> and I am pleading, Swami, please, you know what I've done. But I couldn't answer and I was petrified. I was embarrassed. And you know, that time you feel like the earth should open and you should disappear inside. There's no escape. And then he looked at me. He, he realized I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to admit it. So he said, Kumbh Karan, Aadha time sota hai, Aadha time khata hai. And he went off inside. But, you know, then later on when I thought about whatever happened, I realized that that Juta Bhakti, Juta Bhakti was for me. It was not for the other person. So therein began the transformation. So now I realized that everything has, doesn't have to be literal. There are a lot of things which Swami says, which are meant for you, right? But He doesn't say it directly. And sometimes He says things indirectly also. And uh, and one of them was, then I also realized what He was saying in my first interview with Him. Because until that time, I didn't realize. In my first interview, I'm a, before I came to Baba, I used to go a lot to Vaishnu Devi. So, Devi, Devi used to come in my dreams and say, come, you know, for a long time you haven't had my darshan. And she used to give me things like that in the form of a small girl and I used to go. So, uh, very often to that, to Vaishnavi. So, so, when I came to Puttaparthi, all that thing stopped. So, but in my first uh, interview, there was a student of Swami whose mother had passed away. And uh, Swami turned to me and told me, look, he is not sad. He is not crying because he says, you are my mother. That that mother was my physical mother, but you are my real mother. And Swami said, I will always be with him, you know. So actually what Swami was telling me indirectly was, he is my mother. You know, and that has always been my relationship also. So it was only after that I realized these small, small things which kept coming back to me. Now, they were very subtle. Swami doesn't say things directly. They don't say, I am your mother, you know, like that. He tell you in a very indirect way and let you figure it out. So that was 
another process of being able to transform yourself to think subtly, not literally, you know, and that is a very important spiritual process. So we have to, everybody who is on the spiritual path has to develop that kind of uh, thinking, subtle thinking process. That is one of the biggest lessons I learned. And then, then it uh, went further about the anticipation part, what Swami would anticipate. So when we started work, uh, you know, being around Swami, we kind of started syncing with him and then we realized what he wanted before he said what he wanted, you know, and ready for that. But that's a process and it's a difficult process because we have to overcome a lot of our pre-notions that we have, we have to give them all up, we have to empty our mind and be open to only what he wants. Then we can overcome, then we can actually reach that particular stage, which is a difficult problem because the ego doesn't allow you, you know. The ego doesn't al allow you and uh, one Swami told me that you're lazy. We are lazy, especially mentally, we are very lazy because it takes a lot of contemplation to be able to develop that ability, you know. So contemplation and meditation is a very important part of the spiritual progress which Swami always made us aware of, you know. You must contemplate. And you know, simple ways used to say, after bhajan, don't talk to anyone. Spend the time after that, 10 minutes after that, without talking to anyone, sit in silence, absorb what you have, you know, or energy, whatever energy you have gained. Then slowly start moving into the activities that you're doing, things like that. They're very simple. And Swami's, in the beginning, one of the, one of the things that Swami was very, very tough about was discipline. Very disciplined. He used to be very particular about that. In fact, he would send the messages, you know, through Kutum Rauji, who was the secretary at that time. Um, tell, tell this guy to leave, throw him out, you know, like that. So, we used to be very scared. When we, once the interview room door closed, we never looked up. Either we were reading or meditating. You know? Never opened eyes, never looked around, never. Because he was very particular. Very, very particular. One of the things he said in the, I remember, uh, to a group of us, don't look up and walk. Look down at your toes and walk. Mind your own business. Walk, looking down at your toes. Do not say Sairam to anybody. Don't disturb anyone. Mind your own business. Very strict about it. And, you know, we think Swami doesn't know anything. He used to say, where, where do you think I am, sir? Where am I? Where am I? You think I'm in the interview room? I'm in the mandir? No, I'm everywhere. I see you, you know. I know what you're doing. So a lot of experiences we had where you would tell us what we, what we were thinking, what we were doing. And uh, I, I've had such beautiful experiences when after darshan, after bhajan, you know, we were walking back and a brother is walking with me and we were exchanging Swami's experiences. Swami's vibhuti fragrance would suddenly follow, uh, start, uh, you know, uh, you can smell the vibhuti. And then until we reach the hostel, the whole vibhuti thing would be following us, you know. Amazing things like that. So. So that, that's why when we asked Swami, he said, you know, when I'm happy, I these things, I do these things. My mother asked him, Swami, why do you do this? Because at, in our home, we burnt agarbatti. And can you imagine that the whole agarbatti ash did not fall down, it became an om, perfect om, with the thing and impossible. So we took a picture of that and we brought it, uh, and one of the interviews that Swami gave us, that those days my parents were not here in Puttaparthi. Uh, my mother showed it to Swami. Swami in CV, this, he said, yeah, yeah, I know I did it. So my mother asked Swami, why do you do these things? What, what are you trying to say? He said, no, that's my nature. When I'm happy, these things happen. I do these things. See, first of all, uh, now, now that Swami is not there in the physical form and we are not interacting with him physically, the the way to prepare ourselves is purification. We have to first of all purify our body, our mind, our intellect. So, uh, what is purity? And Swami explained in very beautiful terms: oneness of thought, word, and deed is purity. 
So what you think and what you say and what you do have to be synchronized. And Swami says that very clearly, right? Otherwise, it is impurity. Whatever, if we think something and say something and do something, then it's going to be impure. So that does not help us in our spiritual level. It's one of the most difficult things to learn, by the way, to say what you really mean. Uh, but of course, Swami also has other advice, like if it's something bad, you don't, you should not share it. You can keep quiet about it. Or if it harms somebody, you know, you should not speak. But uh, the thing is that self-contemplation is what leads to it. So it's, it's, a, it's a process. So uh, one of the best ways of doing that would be when we sit at night before we sleep in the evening. Think about what you know, you've done, what has happened during the day, and then see where you went wrong and then try to fix it. You know, it needs a lot of courage also. Second thing is sadhana. You know, so sitting in silence f for me is, you know, one of the best things. So I love to do that, sit in a silent room, <clears throat> no distractions, and just connect with Swami. You know, that's one of the most beautiful experiences I've had. That's what I spend my time mostly with now. Even when I'm in my office, you know, I... Just sit quietly and I, you know, I go into myself because of the practice. I, I can now go into myself and connect with him. And then I'm like, even if I'm in a crowd, I'm like all alone, you know, with him. So that brings peace and that brings happiness and that also brings clarity because you realize certain things which you wouldn't realize if, it, if your brain was, your, sorry, you know, brain, your mind was scattered everywhere, you know. So it focuses your mind, it reduces, you know, Patanjali used to say, reduce the number of uh, thoughts that you have. So that is the process, yoga, is proce yoga process is that. Reduce the thought process and the number of thoughts until you have only one thought. And then from the one thought, you go into no thought, you know. That's what the whole process of, of uh, Ashtang Yoga is. But, and the... You have to practice the physical purity as well as the inner purity, outer purity, inner purity, yam niyam in yoga. So when we do that, when we start practicing that, so how can we achieve this? Decide a way of life. Whichever path you are following, decide a way of life, follow that particular path, those principles, live your life according to that, okay? Spend a lot of time in contemplation. Start with like, I, I started with 10 minutes. I, I still remember in Kashmir, it used to be like cold, you know, like extreme cold. I, I used to have this blanket around me and I used to practice the Jyoti meditation and out of the 10 minutes, I think eight minutes I used to sleep and <laughs> two minutes I used to. But I started like that. So you start like that and slowly we increase the time you know from 10 minutes to 15 and etc so practice is very important okay being true to yourself you don't have to be true to anybody else not even to god to yourself you because you yourself swami you know once i told swami you are my god he said hey kya doubt hai so i didn't understand what is he saying doubt i mean doubt why is there a doubt Am I doubting he is God or, you know, so. then, he, then he went on to explain, he said, you are also God. Why do you doubt it? What he meant is, why are you doubting that? You are also God. So that connection is what we want to, uh, so we need to clean the, it's like uh, described in some of the scriptures, it's like a mirror covered, covered with dust, you know. We need to clean the dust. How do we clean the dust? By doing spiritual sadhana. So it, it may be like practicing pranayam, yoga, or self-contemplation, or practicing a particular principle of truth, you know. That's how we cleanse ourselves. And as we have to be patient, because it's a time-taking process, God is infinite, and He is timeless. Time only exists for us, so we are in a hurry. But in spirituality, there is no hurry. As Krishna says in the Gita, to Arjuna, you, wherever you left off, you start from there, you know. So you don't have to worry about 
I have to have a deadline. I have to achieve that. I have to reach there, you know, by this time. No, no. You have to proceed sometimes slowly, sometimes just quickly, sometimes slowly. But you have to, as Swami says, follow the master, you know, fight to the end. So that's very important. So follow the master is follow the inner conscience, follow Swami's words, because he is the inner conscience, and try to live up to his words. You know? That is the education that we, we need to do, we need to have. And read, read about Swami. Read about his words, read about his philosophy, read about his ideas. They are so simple. You don't have to read anything. You don't have to read the Gita. You don't have to read uh, any other scripture. If you read Swami's words, they are enough. And they will lead you, you know. They will lead you. So, as you start, and as Patanjali says, when you start on the spiritual process, you develop riddhis and siddhis. So, these are indicators that you have reached a particular level. They are not powers to use, they are indicators. Like one of the first uh, riddhis you will develop is, when you think of somebody or something, it will be there in front of you. It will happen. So, you know, this is a spontaneous, natural process. So as we uh, keep on moving slowly on this path, slowly but steadily, we will evolve spiritually. And our goal is, the ultimate goal, of course, but we should not have a timetable, you know. We should proceed step by step, step by step. And as we proceed, we become more and more evolved, more aware. And that's the whole process. I mean, your life becomes much better because of that, you know. So, uh, I, I remember for us, a lot of us, who were Swami students at that time. It didn't matter whether Swami told us to sweep the streets of Puttaparthi. We were ready for that. Give us a small, just give us one corner, you know. We are ready to street, uh, sweep the streets of Puttaparthi, no problem. Give us one corner at your lotus feet, you know, like that. So, f even for the devotee, it should be like that. Uh, as Meera sang in her bhajan, you know, the treasure that I have received is the name of God, you know. So you don't need anything else. So you can live under one tree with that name. That gives you everything. It gives you all the happiness that you ever desire. All the ananda that you ever desire. And the worldly ananda, worldly happiness, nothing compared to that ananda. So what do you, do? you don't need anything, basically. You just need that name, you know. Just hang on to it. Just hold on to his lotus feet. Hold on to his name. Everything will be sorted out, you know. Everything will be okay.